At one point or another, you have probably asked the question of whether or not aliens have visited this planet. But have you ever wondered if we're the aliens? All right, let me phrase that a different way. Is Earth the only refuge for life in the vast expanse of space or is the universe teeming with alien microbes, animals, and even entire civilizations? If we are all alone, space would feel, to me, terrifyingly empty. And, well, all that emptiness would be kind of a waste of space. On the other hand, if we detect even one radio broadcast signal from a faraway planet or detect a single microbe on, say, Mars or Venus or the moon Titan, then we can be pretty sure that life is common throughout the entire universe. In fact, it would probably be absolutely everywhere. And this begs this other question that I noodle on all the time. Where does life come from in the first place? Barring any religious explanations, there are basically two camps when it comes to the question of the formation of life. Abiogenesis and panspermia. Abiogenesis is the first and leading contender of these two ideas that states that given the exact right conditions, life can form spontaneously out of inert matter. At one point in the primordial soup of Earth's past, chemicals and amino acids on our rocky planet somehow, maybe from like a lightning strike or something, just burst into lifeliness. It was the very first life form. They call it Luca, our last common ancestor. And over the course of billions of years, that life form evolved into ever more advanced and complex organisms before presto, humans. Abiogenesis is seductive because the Earth needs to be a pretty special place to become the cradle of life. And there's no guarantee that other places in the universe have the exact right mix of variables to replicate what happened here. When you really get to thinking about it, abiogenesis almost inevitably leads to the conclusion that since Earth is so darned unique in terms of where it is in the galaxy, how it's protected by a moon, and has this nice, lush atmosphere and a hundred other factors, it makes it almost impossible for life to appear anywhere else. Skeptics of alien life look at abiogenesis as evidence that we are more likely than not alone, something that's called the rare earth hypothesis. But there's this other camp too. Uh, It's called panspermia, and it gets me excited because it posits that life on earth could have started even before our planet formed in the first place. Here's the idea. The seeds of life exist throughout the entire universe in the form of something pretty similar to bacteria and something that contains DNA or RNA bundles that arrive on the fertile planetary soil of planets everywhere in much the same way that sperm makes its way to a fertile human egg or a flower disseminates its seeds on the wind. In this theory, life only needs to arise one time on one planet since the beginning of time in order to spread throughout the universe through celestial impacts, space dust, and the explosive force of supernovas. Once life starts traveling between the planets on the backs of this ejected matter, so long as it can survive the hardships of space, simply random movements and the attractive force of gravity means that eventually those floating space rocks, those seeds, will eventually make their way to planets and start reproducing. Presto, life arrives like it comes from a celestial stork. And there are a lot of ways that bacteria-covered rocks might make their way through the cosmos, waiting to impregnate a fresh planet. Just a few years ago, observers at the Haleakala Observatory in Hawaii detected an interstellar object zooming through our solar system, and they called it a muamua. The spinning oblong object was moving too fast to be from our solar system, so it had to come from somewhere else. If it was covered in bacteria, then it could easily spread its seeds to any planet that it happens to hit. And we know that Earth was bombarded by all sorts of similar objects when it first formed almost 4 billion years ago. 
According to NASA, Earth gets bombarded by 25 million meteors and meteoroids every single day. That's a full half million kilograms of space dust that settles on Earth's surface. All told, that's 15,000 tons of debris every year. And if just one lucky alien bacteria hitched along for a ride, then there could be an Earth garden in no time. Now, I know this sounds crazy, but planets trade rocks between themselves all the time. All that needs to happen for a bacterial seed to move between a planet is for a sufficiently powerful meteor to crash into that planet's surface with enough force to send debris back out into orbit. While rare, meteor hunters have actually found rocks from Mars on Earth that have been ejected from similar events. Back in 1996, Bill Clinton even made a speech that one of those rocks might have even had fossilized bacteria inside of it. Today, Rock 84001 speaks to us across all those billions of years and millions of miles. It speaks of the possibility of life. If this discovery is confirmed, it will surely be one of the most stunning insights into our universe that science has ever uncovered. So later, after Bill Clinton gave that speech, the scientists walked back their claims a little bit, saying that the supposed fossils could have arisen through ordinary geological processes. But it still means that they're looking at this as a real possibility. Various experiments have shown that some bacteria can survive for years in space and then return to Earth and continue to reproduce. We know that certain extremophile organisms can survive and evolve even in really, really hospitable lava tubes at the bottom of the ocean under intense pressure with no light, while other bacteria can remain dormant in ice and sediment for as long as 65 million years and still be thawed out and revived to continue on as if nothing had happened. While no organism has passed all of these criteria in like a laboratory experiment, it's certainly plausible that some could. And it only takes a single bacteria to land on a foreign world to start reproducing. Let's also pause to remember that all of the material that makes up Earth, and even the sun itself, didn't originate here. The sun is technically a yellow-orange main-sequence dwarf star, which was born about 4.6 billion years ago out of a cloud of coalescing dust and gas in the Milky Way galaxy. All of that dust and gas got there itself because of prior supernovas where earlier stars burned so hot that they exploded, sending matter and whatever was orbiting them in all directions. If there had been life on planets orbiting any of those stars, then the very act of obliteration could have been the mechanism for spreading the seeds of life to far-fung places everywhere. This is a surprisingly similar method that some pine trees use to disperse their seeds while waiting for the scorching heat of a wildfire to explode their pine cones and cast those seeds out on the wind. Panspermia is, by far, my favorite theory on the origins of life on Earth for a few reasons. First, it pushes back the origin of life to a time before Earth even formed, which could explain why all of our attempts to create artificial life here by replicating early Earth conditions in our own laboratories have failed to produce more than a few interesting amino acids. If complex chemicals like DNA originated elsewhere in other conditions, we might simply be trying the wrong techniques to understand abiogenesis in the first place. Second, if panspermia is true, it doesn't only mean that life is abundant through the entire universe, but there's a good chance that a lot of life is even distantly related. It's potentially possible that if we do one day make contact with an alien species, that they use the same basic building blocks of life that we do. Because at one point, we all had a common bacterial ancestor. In other words, if panspermia actually happened, then the next time someone asks you whether you believe aliens have, in fact, visited Earth, you can answer that maybe we've been the aliens all along. 
Before I go, I want to point you to something that talks about what I'm talking about here even better. It's in the second season of this amazing podcast called Wild Thing Space Invaders, where the host, Laura Krantz, who also happens to be my wife, dives into the chemical and extraterrestrial origins of life in a multi-part narrative show. She interviews top scientists at NASA, and SETI, as well as the naval pilots who reported strange objects outside of their airplane windows. Earlier this year, Laura turned that second season into a middle grade children's book called Is There Anybody Out There? That's designed to make your kid fall in love with science and space, and that's super cool. One of my favorite parts of Wild Things where she tackles the famous mathematical formula by the astrophysicist Frank Drake in 1961 that is now known as the Drake Equation. Essentially, Drake decided to calculate the probability of life showing up spontaneously on a planet by making some guesses about what life needs to exist and then eventually communicate itself to the rest of the universe. And this involves the right kind of stars, to the rate of planet formation around those stars, all the way to the ability of life to send detectable radio signals out into the cosmos that we then could pick up. The Drake equation is amazingly versatile, and in the last 80 years, we've gotten a lot closer to solving it than when Drake first wrote it down. But Drake, well, he made one assumption that might have been incredibly wrong when he didn't account for how life could move between planets and solar systems through non-high-tech processes. Panspermia might add another variable to his calculations that lets life spread through the stars without any advanced technology at all. Which isn't to say like panspermia didn't exist as a theory, it was actually coined in 1904, but, and, and Drake certainly knew about it, but still, he didn't seem to account for it in his equations. Anyway, thanks so much for being here with me today. For those of you who haven't been here in a while, I want to announce that I have some new features for special members to this channel who can get early access to videos before they officially premiere, as well as a few choice chat interactions for people who want to catch my live streams. You can sign up for memberships. I think it's just like right below this video. There's probably like a box to like join click that box and remember to like, share, and subscribe so that this video can spread throughout the internet like a bacteria festooned planet that's just been pulverized by an intergalactic comet.